Awesome. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to Wolf Ezo's Fursona Character Development for Amateurs. And with me, Wolf Ezo. And and just before we start, I just want to give a quick shout out to all the staff and volunteers of Ferality for putting this amazing experience together. It's my second Ferality. I'm very happy I was invited back a second time to present my panel. Uh, it's some incredible stuff they've been put, putting together here and raised almost $14,000 for Save a Fox Rescue. So big shout out, big thank you to all of you out there, the folks in the control booth. You're doing an amazing job. So let's get started. As I said before, it, uh, my panel is on Fursona Character Development for Amateurs with me, Wolf Ezo. And a lot of the art you'll be seeing here in this presentation is done by my buddy Marshall. His uh, Twitter is at Infernational, and I'll put some more contact info at the end of this presentation. So first, who am I? Uh, those of you who don't know, my name is Wolf Ezo. I've been a furry uh, not too long, but pretty much by happenstance. I uh, went to my first furry convention in 2017 on completely on a whim. Uh, didn't really have any interactions with furries beforehand. Had a great time, and I absolutely loved it. And here I am. And you see up here, I'm a tech consultant and a software developer. And why do I say that? That's because, just want to illustrate, I'm not that, I'm not a creative type. I'm not a writer. I'm not an artist. I'm a very data-driven sort of guy. So hopefully, you know, if this kind of sounds like you, hopefully this will help you out. So let's talk about what we're going to cover today. First, it's going to be who this presentation is going to be for, right ways versus wrong ways to do things, your species choice and your visuals and how it impacts your character, and creating uh, your character foundations. And then something I talk about, a lot about is themes, not lore. And then developing a character profile. So, who is this presentation for? Biggest ones for are new furries. There's a, the fandom's growing, guys. There's more furries every day. And old guys like me, we aren't leaving. So there's a lot of new furries, a lot of new fursonas, which is crazy to think about because there was a time in my life where there were no, I had never met a furry that had been in the fandom, you know, newer than me. Everyone's been in there longer than me. But I've been meeting so many furries that have been in just for a few years and it just feels weird that now I'm becoming one of the old guys. Pretty cool. Also existing people who have a new fursona, you know, you want some more character depth, there you go. And this presentation is also for those who don't really have a lot of uh, creative skill. I mean, I just put a lore mipsum up there because I didn't know what to put. And even less creative is that's exactly, I just copied and pasted the whole bullet point from my last time I did this presentation. Couldn't think of anything. And also, folks like me who are analytical types, you know, people who think in spreadsheets and data, I don't really think in, you know, artistic visions and such. I envy those who do, but I'm a very just cut and dry, data-driven type of guy. So if one of these sounds like you, then awesome. This presentation's for you. And, you know, there's a lot of experienced writers and people that are really creative. This might not be as helpful for you, but I welcome you to, you know, still sit and watch. So a little bit of a bamboozle. I talked about the right way and wrong way to do your fursona. There is no right way or wrong way, Doctor, because your fursona is you. You can play your fursona however you want. There is no wrong way to do it. And fursonas can, for some, can just be, you know, I'm just a, fur, a fuzzy version of myself. Others can be a form of escapism where I'm a completely different person. There's no wrong way to do it. And however complex you want to make your character all depends on you too. You can be a super in-depth, you know, gritty person with all sorts of backstory, or you can just be, you know, dumb, cute, happy dog who just wants head pats, or somewhere in between, like I am. It's all valid. There's no wrong way to do it. And a little second bamboozle. With comes to character species, choice, and visuals, people always ask me, oh, Ezo, you know, how should I make my character look? Should I change my species? No. Don't do that. Be what you want. Look how you want. It doesn't really matter what you look like. You can play your character however you want. And even a hard stop can still be worked around. And, like, what do I mean by a hard stop? Before I, 
probably the second time I did this panel, I pretty much put there was a little clause of if you know certain things might cause issues. One of my friends had a protogen for Sona, really connected with that, and was kind of tired of existing only in a sci-fi space. And he actually made an alternate version of that protogen that existed in a fantasy role-playing space, but rather than a computerized display and mechanics, it was more of like a reanimated golem with glowing runes that would, you know, animate the eyes. I'm like, that's pretty awesome. I didn't even think about doing something like that. So even like a hard stop, like a species choice that can't quite fit in a setting, you can still be, have creative ways to work around it. Now, one thing I want everyone to take away from this with developing your character, your persona is make a relatable character. Relatability is key. Make a relatable character. That's one thing you remember from this. Make a relatable character. And just a quick shout out to all my boys in Standards Contracting. We're an EVE Online PvP corporation. Love these guys to death. You can see I'm right there. And shout out to like the three of you out there who are watching. <laughs> now, let's talk about character themes. Much like a building needs a foundation to kind of be propped up and stand, your persona should also have themes to kind of build a foundation for your character. Now, we're going to be talking more about themes in depth later in this presentation, but just a few things to keep in mind. Make sure you keep things intentionally vague and not too specific. And remember that this is your persona, not a storybook character or a graphic novel character or like a video game character. This is a representation of you within the fandom. So you don't need to get too specific and granular with things. And also, try to avoid dealing with copyright and, and other people's intellectual property as your main focus. But that being said, it's a lot of fun to kind of dabble in other intellectual properties. I mean, you know, none of these here are, you know, what you'd consider my main self. But, you know, if you're a big fan of something, please get some art done. Throw yourself in those universes. It's a lot of fun. But, you know, no one really knows me as a, a Gundam pilot or a commissar or a Animal Crossing character. But those are things I love, and it's fun to join those. So, you know, feel free to dive into those, but don't make that your, what you base your persona around. Now, a little, we're going to go back in time a little bit. About, man, 20 years ago now almost, there was the, an MMORPG called Star Wars Galaxies. It was a sandbox art MMO set in the Star Wars universe. It was a a revolutionary game for its time. There was no, there was no, no real focus on having to be a combat character. You could, there were player-made cities, there were player politician classes, there were, you know, cantinas, and there were players there who were musicians and entertainers that would actually, you know, help you out and regain hit points. There's uh, cooks and fashion designers and the doctors and nurses would be in player-made medical centers healing your wounds. It was very different from any MMO you see today. And that all changed after World of Warcraft was released. They decided to kind of axe all that out and make it much more of a combat-focused sort of game. Some say it was better, and I mean, gameplay-wise, it actually did get better, but it took away a lot of the depth and connection people had with their characters. And the team responsible said that nobody wants the uncle Uncle Owen experience. Now, what's the Uncle Owen experience? For those of you who aren't Star Wars fans, Uncle Owen is Luke Skywalker's uncle in episode four. He was a moisture farmer, not a very glorious job. He sat around, drank blue milk, farmed moisture. Nothing incredible. And the Uncle Owen experience is pretty much saying that no one wants to be a background character. No one wants to be a tertiary character. Everyone wants to be the main character. But, I mean, I don't quite agree with that. Because what we're trying to do is make a relatable character. And do you know what's not relatable to me? Being a hero, being a villain. What's not relatable to me is being a powerful politician or a titan of industry or some other sort of grand person in this world. No, I, I relate to being, you know, an office worker. I relate to being, you know, someone working in a restaurant on someone working in a warehouse, you know, a common person. So be mediocre. It's okay. You know, even if your character is, you know, like my character kind of is known as like a space captain or something. I'm not, 
not even a good space captain. I'm not a commander. I'm not an admiral. I'm just some freelancer who's not really good at his job. And, and that, that's pretty relatable. And one thing to take away is if everyone's a main character, then nobody's a main character. So focus on being me like mediocre. As weird as it is to think about it, because mediocre is relatable, and the goal is to make relatable characters. See? That's the one thing you want to take back. Be relatable. And also, I definitely don't want you to think that you need to be serious all the time, or you need to be, you know, dark and gritty to have depth. Have fun. Be funny. Be silly. Do whatever you want to do. This is, you know, your representation of you in the fandom. You know, be expansive. It's okay. You don't need to be serious all the time. Now, a big takeaway I like to have from this too is that the focus on themes versus lore. People talk to me when they know I do like a character development panel and they like want to talk to me about lore and like what kind of lore my character has, but I don't like lore. I think lore is good for, you know, characters in books and novels and movies, but not for someone that's supposed to represent you within a, an actual social space like the fandom. Now, what's the difference between themes and lore? Themes are flexible. So let's just take me as an example because, you know, I know myself the best. A theme of my character is kind of a, uh, like a roguish scoundrel with some charisma. Now, lore might be you know, I'm a, uh, a smuggler from the, uh, from the, uh, the Molden Heath region, and the reason my fur is red is because of the nebulas around, and I work for XYZ faction, and I'm from this, and it's very detailed and granular. When really, just saying, you know, like, I'm a scoundrel who kind of operates outside the norms, but I'm really close to those who I do actually connect with. That's, you know, very general, very vague. That's a theme. And the theme can be applied to any sort of time setting, any sort of scenario. Like, working off of my, like, roguish scoundrel example, I kind of use that as a, uh, put that example into space. I mean, I could also be a roguish scoundrel that operates outside the norms in an Age of Sail 18th century setting. Or even a fantasy role-playing setting. Or even just, you know, modern real life. It's, a, it's very flexible, and you can kind of just put your character into different areas, and it works really well. And lore, you write yourself into a corner. It's like playing the snake game. You're going to eventually run to a wall that you created yourself, and that's not good. And world building is fun, but try to avoid getting caught up in it, especially if it's just for your persona. I mean, I've caught myself thinking of all sorts of crazy ideas, and it is a lot of fun, but... In terms of when you're getting started and getting depth for your persona, just skip it for now. So let's talk a little bit, kind of, kind of on the world building thing, we're going to talk about an environmental theme. So here's an example I like to run through. The theme is a multi-sided territorial conflict. Pretty straightforward. Going from my bread and butter space, Taking this theme, you have a multi-faction space war over planets and resources. That's a multi-sided territorial conflict. And the exact same theme, but in a very different setting, is rival businesses that are working, to, working against each other to launch a new product in an emerging marketplace. That emerging marketplace is territory. All these rival businesses are, you know, multi, multiple sides. That's the same theme, but very different settings. And just as a third example, you know, I'm a big fan of post-apocalyptic themes. I love Mad Max. I, uh, it's been uh, always close to my heart. So you have post-apocalyptic cartels and war bands that are going to war against each other to recapture some old world oil wells. That's multiple sides going over territory and resources. That's all the same theme, but all three very extremely different settings. But it all works. You can make your, you know, you can toss your character into any of those sorts of environments and it'll work just fine. So let's actually talk about character themes now. Now we kind of talked earlier about how character themes are going to be the foundations or the building blocks of your character. And I, like I said before, you want to keep it generic and vague. Don't get too in depth depth about things because then that's getting into the kind of the lower space you know talking about me again with the, the roguish scoundrel examples you know it can fit into multiple scenarios 
it works well. And when we start talking about things like character motivations or flaws, you can also draw that from these themes as well. And we'll be talking about motivations and flaws here in a bit. And you know you have a solid theme if you can apply it into different settings and time, you know, time areas of time and scenarios, kind of like we talked with those examples. So when you're coming up with themes, just pick it up and try to put it into different zones and see how it works. And also, like they say, you know, work with what you know. You know, I'm kind of a, you know, I don't want to say I'm like a scoundrel in real life or anything, but it kind of fits my personality type and I know how to play it. And one reason I work with the space theme a lot is because I've always been a big fan of space. I play a lot of sci-fi games, huge fan of sci-fi media. So I have that little bit of a knowledge base to work off of. So, you know, stick with the things you know. It makes things a lot easier. Now, some considerations when you're working on your character themes is, you know, think of a generic role or a job for you to have. See, like, one of the things for my character is usually, you know, like a, like a, you know, sort of like a smuggler or a scoundrel, just some, you know, some freelancer, you know, just always going from job to job, trying, you know, just get, you know, just get, make it by. And also make sure to, you know, if you have hobbies and interests, like we all do, you know, build from that, uh, especially with your fursona. I mean, some of the coolest things I've seen are just people incorporating their real life hobbies into their fursona. One of my friends, Nekomon, got a, a, uh, an art commission done of him. He loves to bake, does amazing baking stuff, some of the best stuff I've tasted. Had a commission of him as his fursona, just pulling a tray of baked goods out of the oven. I absolutely loved that. It just, it's, it's relatable. It helps you build a connection with someone else's character. So. Definitely draw on your own hobbies and interests. And with personality types, this is kind of a, you know, it's kind of a, uh, I don't really like that as much, so I should maybe take it out of my presentation. But, you know, if your character is kind of, you know, dark and broody, you know, make sure they, you know, continue with that. If they're, you know, bubbly and happy or somewhere in between, make sure they stick with that. And like I said before, be mediocre. You don't want to be too good at what you do as a character, you know, because we're trying to be relatable and mediocrity is very relatable. And you're going to use these themes to establish like a foundation of your character. And then we're going to go on the next step, which is building a profile. Now, also with the hobbies and interests part, you don't have to have things be taken extremely literally. Like this is my friend Tristan and I, we're both avid anglers of Maryland. You know, we both like to fish. They like to do fly fishing. I like to do lake fishing. Very different. But also, we also, we play EVE Online together. And there's jokes in the game about, you know, bait ships and tackle ships. So here's just a little meme about us being fishers and also about bait and tackle within EVE Online. So there's like five of you out there who get this joke, and I appreciate that. But this is just a way where you can kind of cheekily refer to hobbies and interests in game without actually literally referring to them. So let's talk about character profiles. We're going to put our themes to use and kind of building a little bit more granular on what makes our character a character. Now we'll be talking about these in later slides, but one thing you want to think about are motivations. What makes your persona do what they do? Is it something good? Is it something bad? Is it just something selfish? It doesn't really matter, but just think about why they do what they do. And flaws. Flaws are a big one. If always have flaws with your character. It makes us very relatable because none of us are perfect. We all have flaws. And if we all have something, it makes us much more relatable to have it. And talking about quirks and traits, now these aren't as a needed thing, but they do add just a little bit of flavor to your character. They aren't things that are actually, you know, affect your character, but it's cool to have. It's little relatable things. And we'll go through all these here right now. And before we go on, just a little statement from uh, my buddy Marshall, who's done all this art in the presentation so far. So a little thing about character development, which is not only is it important to realize how a character's psyche is informed by their past, past and their journeys they go through, but to recognize the subtle and indirect ways it might impact minor details. Not everything needs to be attributable to a major plot point, but it needs to make organic sense.
So motivations, you know, this drives that drives the what and why of your character. Not every motivation needs to be good. Not every motivation needs to be bad. They can be selfish. They can be charitable. They can be somewhere in between. They can just be all sorts of things. But if your character has some sort of thing they like to do, think about why they do it. Now, quirks and traits, this is something I've built upon a little bit more since the last time I gave this presentation. Now, these are just the minor qualities of your character that they don't really affect anything, you know, story-wise or development-wise or theme-wise, but they do add a little bit of extra flavor. You know, they don't need to be draw from any backstory. They don't need to have any reasons. Like, for example, I'm kind of a, a talk-a-lot guy. As you can tell, I just like to ramble on. So my character has a, an overly social quirk. And here he is talking to a stranger on a subway. I've kind of talked to strangers on the metro before, too. Not something everyone would do. It's just something weird about me. Go figure. And like an example of a quirk might be, uh, let's say, you know, you as a person in real life, you really like tea. You know, the, the hot, you know, steeped beverage. You know, you love black tea, white tea, green tea, oolong tea, jasmine tea, herbal tea, chai tea, you know, matcha. You, you're just obsessed with it. You love drinking it. Why not make your character like tea too? It doesn't have to have a reason to why you like tea, but your character knows a lot about tea and it's something they enjoy. Just a little bit of something relatable that you can add to your character. And make sure to be consistent with it because, you know, let's say that going off this tea example, if your character likes tea and they're in some store, you know, they're offered a tea and they don't want it, they then you have a good reason to not want it because they love tea. Or, you know, they actually would accept said tea. So make sure to be consistent with the quirks and traits. Now, flaws are a big one. Flaws are relatable. Make sure you have them. They can draw from your backstory. They can draw from your, your themes. They can draw from the environment. But flaws are super relatable, and we're trying to make relatable characters. Now, flaws must cause a problem for the character. Just kind of a, a, a you know, a real life advice is if you're in a job interview and someone asks you, you know, like, what's your biggest weakness? What's your biggest flaw? Don't say something like, oh, I just work too hard or I'm too dedicated. That's not a flaw. That's not a weakness. That's just you trying to humble brag and disguise it as that. That's not really causing you a major problem or anything. And with your flaws, they don't need to be overly dark. They don't need to be life or death. They don't need to be, you know, super depressing or anything. But also make sure they're in line with your quirks and traits. Like if I have a flaw of that Ezo is, you know, freezes up around people and has a hard time talking with people, even though he has an overly social quirk, then that doesn't really work, if you can kind of see. Now to kind of put it into practice, let's talk about some flaws. So just using an example, kind of a real life example with our, our fake uh, guinea pig here. So. Example of not a flaw is Dale likes to stay up late. He has trouble waking up, and sometimes it makes his day hectic. I mean, it's something we can relate to. Staying up late kind of makes our days hectic, but it doesn't really, you know, make things pretty you know, rough for us. Now, moving on to kind of a little bit towards the flaw in the center is Dale likes to sleep in so much that he ends up late to events and obligations, and that's... That makes his friends mad at him. Now that is causing a problem now. It's straining the relationship between Dale and his friends. This is, so this would be, you know, it's getting to that flaw territory. It's technically a flaw, but it's not, it's not fully flushed out. So let's crank it up to 11 now. And Dale's sleep issues have cost him multiple jobs and friends. And he would rather stay up late, focused on himself rather than do what he should do. Now here, that's a flaw because, you know, he knows what he should do, but he still keeps doing the bad thing. And it's actually cost him jobs, it's cost him relationships, it's strained uh, remaining relationships he's had with people. That is a flaw. And I know that's, I'm pretty sure this is relatable to most of you out there, you know, staying up too late and making your next day a little bit rough. So if that was too real, let's kind of delve back into the whole uh, fantasy setting of things, using me as, as an example this time. So... This is more about personal reckless endangerment. So not a flaw would be, I struggle commanding my ship when engaging a specific faction, we'll just call it this the cartel. 
I get reckless, but my crew and friends around me always keep me in check to make sure nothing bad happens. That's not a flaw. Nothing bad's actually happening. You know, making reckless decisions, but I have sort of a, you know, a safety net there so it doesn't really cause problems. Now, getting into an actual flaw, my personal vendetta against the cartel has led me to taking missions a bit too seriously, and I've gone scorned for my superiors because of it. So now this has strained my relationship between me and my superiors, my superior officers. So now that's starting to cause a problem because of the emotional reckless endangerment when engaging a specific faction. Now, just taking it all the way now, my vendetta has led to reckless calls that have put my crew's lives at risk with my brash and emotionally driven actions. This has cost the lives of some of those close to me and it's caused me to be demoted. I mean, people dying is probably as bad as it can get, really. That's a flaw. That's something that would really impact my character and could you know, would not allow me to quite engage with this faction as well as I could. Now, here's something new I've added, I've been working on. This, I call this the Relatability Tower of Fursona Character Development. That is an absolutely terrible name because I'm not a creative person. I'm, like I said, a very analytical, data-driven person. So, if you have a better name, please just at me on Twitter or something. I hate this name. But our goal here with this relatability tower is to just do make a tower. So, like I said, first we start off with the character themes. That establishes our foundation, where we all kind of draw from. And then next above that is the character profile, which are, you know, your motivations and your, flaw, your flaws, etc. And right there, you, ha you have a tower. You know, you have the, the, the base, you have the tower portion, you know. If our goal is to make a tower, you can be done right there. And at the, at the top above the character profile are your quirks and traits. This adds a little bit of extra style. This adds a little bit of extra functionality. So now your tower is you know, full-fledged, looks really nice. Anyone walking along the dirt road goes, hey, that's a tower. Now at the very tippy, 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 tippy top, I don't know if y'all can see it at home, but that, there's a flag up there and it says lore. Now, lore isn't needed. It's, you know, it's important to the owner of the tower to show who owns it, but anyone who's looking for a tower, they're not going to say, oh, you know, that's not a tower because there's not a flag at the very top. So lore is just even extra decoration. It's more important to the owner of the character than it is to the actual, the actual social fandom at large. So don't focus on lore. Focus on these other three things first before you start touching lore. And just some general tips is, you know, be flexible with how you play your character. You know, if you find yourself changing how you want to do things, feel free to do it. The way my character started off was very different from how he ended up now. You know, like when I first made my persona, it was just, uh, you know, I'm a, a, a wolf living in the city who works an office job. You know, literally fuzzy version of myself completely. And I just kind of kept evolving and growing as, you know, I was doing more things and uh, you know, I've added things, subtracted things. It's been fun. And remember, this isn't for a, you know, a novel character or a movie character or video game character. This is for you, your persona, the representation of you within the fandom. So that's why we're not focusing on lore and backstory. And also, you know, don't force yourself to play a character, you know, a character and be comfortable with what you do. You know, if you're not really an overly social person and you want to kind of play a character that really, you know, steps outside the bounds and is super social, but it makes you uncomfortable to do it, don't do it. But if it's something that helps you kind of, uh, you know, via an abstract way, kind of get over your own insecurities and such, please go ahead and do it. And also grow and evolve with your character. Like I said before, my character started off very different from how he ended up now, and I'm still changing it. You know, there's still additions I make, you know, either with themes to my character or, you know, even, you know, style. And, you know, let your character take a life of its own. You know, as you, you know, exist in the fandom with your persona and you start to find out you like new things and, you know, it might counteract what you previously thought about your persona, you know, feel free to evolve, feel free to add things. It's okay. And just to kind of wrap things up, Remember, there's no wrong way to be your fursona. You can be your fursona any way possible. You know, visuals and species choice, things like that, they're, they don't matter. You can look how you want to look. 
And make sure you use themes to create foundations for your character. You know, don't focus on lore, focus on those themes first. And have flaws. Be mediocre. Being mediocre is relatable. And your character, just like you, is a, you know, a living person. Grow, evolve, develop, change things over time. It's okay. You don't have to be stuck in a corner always doing the same thing with your persona. And remember, be relatable. That's the biggest thing. Make relatable characters. Be relatable as best way as possible. A relatable character is much easier to empathize with, much easier to, for other people to, to form an attachment with. Be relatable. And that wraps things up, and we'll start with our Q&A section here soon. Now, if, you have, uh, if after the Q&A, if anyone has any questions or comments, you can just hit me up on my at on Twitter or Instagram at just wolf underscore Ezo. If you like the art you've seen in this presentation, uh, Marshall is an incredibly talented artist. Uh, follow him on Twitter at Infernational, and also support him on Patreon, just at patreon.com slash DWC Martial Arts. Extremely talented guy. I uh, highly recommend his work. It is some incredible stuff. My favorite artist out there in the Phantom today. And that wraps things up. If uh, I guess we could get started with our Q&A section. So you can, uh, I believe in the Discord chat, there will be a channel regarding this presentation. And you can start asking your questions there. And I'll have a lovely assistant hopefully read them off to me so, so I know uh, what y'all are asking. I see you, Dalton. Hi there. Good to see you. Hey, I've Dalton. Got Discord pulled up here. Got some questions Perfect. coming in. Um, so uh, here's the first one from Frost. What would you say about making a Sona that represents you, but you tweak it a little bit to fit in a world that you would want to place yourself in? Yeah, that's perfect. That's totally good to do. Kind of like I had with my pictures of my persona in different environments and different IPs. Same character, but you just tweak it a little bit depending on what kind of world you want to put it in. You you know, you don't have to make a same persona or a different persona. I mean, same persona, just tweak it to whatever environment you want. Like, there's art of me, like, in, my, in fantasy role-playing settings, Ezo is actually a vampire. You know, like a, a vampire noble. In, uh, like, historical settings, he's a, a pirate on the sea. You know, these are very different things from what people know my character as, but they exist. So, yeah, that's a perfect way to do things, Frost. Uh, you mentioned adding flaws to your character, but at what point does a flaw become a character trait? That doesn't make sense. Or what is, what is the difference between those things? I think maybe my definition of trait is a, isn't quite good. I should just keep it as quirks. But for flaws, it's more of a general thing that develops your character. And for traits, I kind of have it as a not really an important thing. So if it's actually influencing your character's decisions, I don't technically have it as a trait. But I think that's just some verbiage I need to update for my, the next time I give this presentation and keep it to quirks only. And maybe uh, put traits into the actual character profile section where motivations and flaws are. So a flaw would, I guess, technically would be a trait. Uh, so in your presentation, you you spoke earlier about uh, uh, that you you're talking about creating a character that's a persona. Um, uh, uh, someone from Twitch is asking, is there a big difference between personas and OCs? Hmm. Not really. I just almost think. I guess you know I could be technically wrong, but I was just kind of viewed a an, a persona as more of like your main. An OC, while you know an OC can be all sorts of various things, but or just an OC, it's just an anthropomorphic OC. So there's not really too much distinction between the two, at least in my head. Uh, let's see. Uh, what are your thoughts on having different personas, but still having a main persona? Do it. Totally good. I mean, like, I, I technically have a second persona, just basically a rabbit form of me, but, you know, this is main me, and it's sometimes fun just to have that, those side characters to hop into, hop, because it's a rabbit, get it, just, just for, you know, a little bit of a, just a little change, a bit of change of pace. Totally good. 
Um, what is your opinion on using a persona as a platform for finding yourself, like a playground of identity? Yes, do that. That's a lot of what I've done, actually, since joining the furry fandom like four or five years ago. Is like Ezo to me is almost like an abstracted layer of myself where I can approach my own approach problems I have in real life and have that little layer of like, oh, how would my persona handle it? And it makes it actually easier to deal with. That's a great use of a persona. I per that's how I personally do it too. Uh, you know, if that's how you do it, that's awesome. You know, use your use your persona to help improve yourself. I'm going to combine a few questions here. Um, sure. Uh, they're about choosing a species uh, for a persona, and what would you say with someone who has trouble connecting to a certain species or appearance of a persona? Hmm, that's a good question. Because at least for me, you know, I haven't really had an issue with connecting. I mean, really comes down to if you find something you connect with, go with it. But it's totally okay just to keep, you know, species swapping and changing your design and doing whatever. Because your goal is to have something you connect with as well. So, you know, keep experimenting, keep trying new things. Like I have a friend who I think he has like, 50 personas maybe and he connects with all of them but you know it's and it's really cool to to see that you, know, you don't have to always limit yourself just with one persona and you know keep trying things keep uh keep going at it you know something hopefully will connect with you eventually how would you know if you're approaching the point of being cliche and how would you avoid that i mean What's the saying that uh, no one ever thinks it's a cliche until it's happening to you or something like that? But you can, you can be cliche. Like it's, it's not like you're writing a a uh, you know a character for a book or anything. But I mean, if I guess things, if you think you're being cliche, then you might be being cliche. But yet again, it's your character. You can be as cliche or as cookie cutter as you want. It's okay. All right, uh, got one here from Twitch. Uh, what are your thoughts on incorporating inspiration from media you like? Oh, I mean, my persona is built. I'm not original at all. My persona has so much inspiration from so many different sources. Uh, you know, you know, go figure. Star Fox was one of them. Uh, like, I love Battlestar Galactica. I love The Expanse. Uh, I love like old Age of Sail pirate stories. You know, I love like the Warhammer universe. My character is just little bits and pieces from all those kind of put together. And I've, you know, added some things. I've taken some things off. I've changed as my, you know, whatever interest I have currently. It's, you know, it's totally cool to, to borrow from that stuff. Just like, like I said earlier, you know, try to avoid making that your main thing. But feel free to borrow characters and borrow, you know, character traits and things like that. You know, by all means, if it, especially if it helps you connect with your character, go for it. So you mentioned that you're not necessarily a creative person yourself. Um, what would you recommend for someone who can't seem to get an image or look or aesthetic to their character um, and, and they're, you know, not able to just draw it out themselves? I'd say, I mean, like, look at me. I, I keep it simple then because, you know, you're really working more on what makes you as a character and connect. So, you know, I start off super, you know, I, I'm still super simple. You know, there's like a thousand other guys out there that look like me, you know, red, white, candid. Uh, you know, you keep it simple. You work on like what makes your persona you. And like, you know, small changes I've made to my own persona over time just have happened. So like the way I look, uh, you know, it, it changes over time. So stick with something simple, uh, work more on your, your character themes and profile, and make changes as you like. It's okay. I got one here from Xeno Soldier. Would your persona need a goal to strive for, to try to achieve? I gotta say, it's more of, you know, what's your goal, you know, as a person to strive to achieve? And us as humans, that's pretty much a survival and it's how do you want to survive pretty much or you know what's important to you as a person you know me myself you know actually you know putting food on the table and hanging out with my friends so those pretty much are what motivate my persona too
Okay. Uh, let's see. So there's uh, a couple different questions here talking about polymorphs. The, so personas that have different forms or um, uh, characters that are based on hybrids. So they're a combination of, of different species. Uh, and uh, I'd like to know your thoughts on, on those types of characters. How does, how does that develop uh, a character? I love I love it, especially if that's something that you feel you connect with, then that is perfect. You know, stick with that. You know, some of us, you know, in the world, you know, don't quite identify with, you know, a single type of person. And so things like polymorphs are great. You can, you know, feel, you know, be who you want to at when you want. And hybrids are perfect. You know, if that's something you connect with, then stick with that. Like I said, you know, species choice and visuals don't really matter for your persona. As long as you connect with it and that's who you feel you are, then go for it. There's no wrong way to do things. Uh, here's one. Uh, as a furry, uh, it feels like it's almost a competition sometimes to stand out, to differentiate yourself. What would you say is the most important to uh, be able to stand out in a world of relatable characters? I'd say that's a tough one because... I think just having a character people can relate with and someone who's real. I think a lot of times people have problems with uh, what's considered like a, like a fake personality and something you really can't connect with. Kind of like I mentioned before, you know, I mean, visually, I'm, I mean, when I'm not a ferality with all these glowing bits on me and these fins, I'm a very generic looking wolf. I, you know, red, black, white, there's thousands of others like me out there. But I like to think it's kind of more just how I portray myself, you know, with, you know, my motivations and how I kind of play my character is what makes me stand out. And I feel that as long as you're being true to yourself and, you know, drawing on your own hobbies and inspirations and interests and showing, you know, the fandom that, you know, you are a person, you have interest, you are, you know, a human being underneath all this, that's much more relatable and people can connect with that versus someone who's just, you know, almost after just social media clout or something that's it comes off as fake from a mile away. So be true to yourself and, you know, show that you are a person. Uh, can contrast make a character more interesting? For example, a character who is very vibrant and colorful in design, but emotionally and mentally struggles. I mean, yeah, that's, uh, that's something I feel a lot of people can relate with is that, you know, you might have a very different sort of exterior personality in real life. Like, I know, you know, even myself, you know, if I'm in a social situation, I might be a bit more talkative and charismatic and interact with people. But, you know, like a lot of us, you know, I suffer from depression and anxiety and, you know, lots of feelings of self-doubt. And that's kind of incorporating that sort of contrast with your character and, you know, definitely do it. Uh, here's one from Twitch. How do you know, uh, what persona actually fits you? What, how, how do you know that it's suiting yourself? I don't know if that there's really a good answer for that because I guess I was lucky where I kind of just like, I made a persona after joining the fandom and I pretty much just equated it with myself. Uh, like, you know, like my species, my species kind of deals with my own, like, you know, interests. Uh, I'm a sea wolf. I love to fish. Uh, you know, I'm a very like pack oriented type of person. So a wolf. So I guess, I don't know. It's just one of those things I maybe just, if you connect, you just know, I guess maybe someone in the chat might be able to have a little discussion or we could talk about this on Twitter, just a little, a talk of what makes people connect with their fursona species. I'd like to actually hear about that. Yeah, I, I I agree. It's a uh, it, it. Sometimes you just get a feeling. Um, other times, I I've heard people. It took them a while to to really feel comfortable with their persona. Thank you. Um. So uh, let's see. Got. Make sure I didn't miss any earlier. We got a lot coming in at one time. Um. <laughs> Uh, is evolution necessary to your persona? No, it's not necessary. But I mean, we as people, we you know we evolve, we grow as people. So 
you want to make your character relatable. And, you know, if your character keeps making the same mistake over and over and over again, then maybe they should grow. Maybe they should kind of learn something because that's relatable. But again, there's no wrong way to do things. You could, your character can be as static as you want and never change. That's totally fine. Um, so here's a question. Uh, you talked about not wanting to focus on uh, finite details. What if you wish for those details to make the character more like you? For example, I have a star tattoo, so my persona has the same. I'd say, you know, you know, try not to mistake lore for like quirks and traits. Because if you have a, if you have a star tattoo and, you know, you want your persona to have one, that doesn't really impact any sort of story or, or uh, you know, process of how your character does things. You know, do it. That's, you know, just a, it's just a visual, a visual addition to your character and it helps you connect with it better. Then that's perfect. And like, there's a, like, there's some additions I've made to my persona, like in art that I, I actually have on like my body in real life. And, you know, it doesn't impact how my character makes decisions or motivations, but it helps me connect better. So yeah, that's awesome. You know, do that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so there is a, a couple here talking about uh, your mixing your the idea of your family into your persona. How, how do you feel about that? Like, uh, I guess if it's more of, you know, from like a background perspective, then that can definitely work versus, you know, like having your family as actual personas and having them be a part. But Having family that kind of represents, you know, or uh, tertiary characters that kind of represent your family, you know, that's, you know, when I talk about work with what you know, that's what you know, that's your family, that's, you know, you can't get any more knowing than that. So if that, you know, that helps kind of develop why your character does things, why they behave the way they do, because, you know, those are the people who raised you and who you're around, that's perfect. Yeah, add that by all means. Uh, let's see. Checking Twitch here again. Um, and just to touch on the species, um, as part of a persona again, um, do you, you know, how, how important would you say the, the sort of inherent traits of a species is? to a persona um if if there's some sort of common idea around a, a certain species to a personality it doesn't always have to be because i mean like a wolves are known as being like you know like pack animals and you know hunters and such and you can play a wolf who's you know not really that social and you know, doesn't like to hunt and eat meat or something it's just more of if you connect with the animal, maybe like at a spiritual level or something. But by all means, you know, if uh, you can draw upon the real life characteristics of your species to, and to incorporate them into your persona, but it's not necessary. You know, you can just like the visuals of how a species look and just that's that's fine. You can stick, you know, just stick it with it right there. All right. Uh, I think we have time for uh, one more here. Um, and, uh, it's, let's see, let me make sure I'm not missing anything up here. Okay, I got a, uh, a good one here. Uh, what do you think about, okay. um, joke characters? So, uh, sometimes people make, like, a comedic um sort of take on on themselves and uh that isn't meant to be taken seriously perfect do that that those are a lot of fun those kind of like the satire characters and just exaggeration characters definitely you know have fun with it you know like i said you don't need to be serious you can actually have you know just a representation of yourself but to an extreme that's more funny that's perfect that's that's great i like that yeah awesome well, um, thank you so much, Ezo, for, for coming and presenting and answering our questions. I uh, appreciate you. Thanks for having me uh, again. Coming to yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs>
and uh we'll wave goodbye yeah have a good